Okay, thank you for inviting me to speak today. And I would like to discuss uh, long-term outcomes from patients who've had acute kidney injury on intensive care unit. And um, I'm just going to declare my potential conflicts of interest. So I would like to use evidence from the um, literature that which we have and also use some of our group's own uh, studies to illustrate what we know about long-term survival uh, and morbidity, and that includes both renal morbidity but also other organ failures which can occur after acute kidney injury. And then I'd like to address the question of how we can actually improve outcome for these patients afterwards. And I would like to use um, a, a patient case to try and illustrate our current knowledge and make it a little bit more relevant. So um, if we start with a lady which I think could present to any of our ICUs any day of the week. This is a 70-year-old lady who presents with a community-acquired pneumonia, a sepsis and an acute kidney injury disease. And it's her sixth day on ICU. And this lady in her past medical history has hypertension and diabetes. And she has a slightly elevated creatinine level, which gives her a GFR, which is slightly under 60. So she already has um, a slight pre-existing renal failure. Um, and this is day six, and she is awake and conscious. She's been extubated. Her circulation is stable, and in terms of her renal function, she's receiving now loop diuretics after four days of renal replacement therapy. And her creatinine is 150, her urea is 16, and her cystatine C is 1.9. So I'd like you to think about this case, which could be any of our patients on ICU, and I'm going to pose a few questions about what you think her outcome uh, likelihoods are. So my first question uh, for you to think about is, what do you think her chances of being alive at one year and at five years are? And secondly, what do you think her renal function will be in the months and years afterwards? And do any of you actually know what the renal function is in your patients after ICU? What do you think her chances are of developing chronic kidney disease? and end-stage renal disease? And finally, do you think that she might be at risk of any other organ dysfunctions in the long term associated with having suffered from AKI? So to begin with, we're going to address mortality. And th this is the bad news, really. These patients have an extremely high mortality, and in particular, a high early mortality. And as we see here from this slide, this is one of our studies from the Swedish Intensive Care Register when we looked at over 100,000 patients. And we found that um, of those that had acute kidney injury, we, looked, we divided them into centiles of death, and the first 30% of patients died within 11 days if they had AKI on ICU. And at the same time, we found that non-AKI patients, it took them two years to die. So it really is a very high early mortality. And if we move on to studies that looked at one-year mortality, well, it depends on the population we look at. Trauma patients in this study from the Karolinska at the bottom here by Eriksson had, uh, obviously, were healthier patients, younger patients, and liver transplant patients have a higher mor mortality. But generally in Scandinavia, it's somewhere around 50% at one year. Um, and... Um, if you survive the first 90 days, you've obviously got a lower mortality, but it's still 20% at one year, even if you survive the first 90 days. And if we go beyond that and look at five years, mortality lies somewhere between 60 and 80%. So extremely high mortality for these patients, particularly early on. But we do have some good news. It is improving over time. And here we have a study from Long and colleagues in Iceland and they looked at hospitalised uh, AKI patients and divided them into quinquennials. And they saw that the latter time period of five years, patients had a 10% better survival. So we are improving, whether it's improvement in our treatment of acute kidney injury disease or ICU and perhaps sepsis treatment in general is unclear, but there is some improvement. So if we go on and look at renal dysfunction, 
we first need to look at a number of definitions of what can happen after acute kidney injury. And we have um, newly been proposed the, uh, the syndrome acute kidney disease, and this is by the ADQI group. This came earlier this year, and they proposed defining the period of time between seven days to 90 days after suffering from acute kidney injury disease, uh, acute kidney injury, as being called AKD and it's been um, defined in a similar way to acute kidney injury in that there's a change in baseline creatinine in percent. So that's the first part of the spectrum. And in terms of the time spectrum, after 90 days, a renal failure will be defined as chronic renal failure, and this normally refers to a GFR under 90. And in terms of a spectrum of severity, those with the most severe chronic kidney disease um, with a GFR generally acceptably under 15, would be defined as having end-stage renal disease. It depends slightly on which side of the Atlantic you are on as to which, as how you define end-stage renal disease. But also included in this group are patients who have um, dialysis requirement or transplantation requirement. So if we think about what might happen to the kidney after acute kidney injury, we can think about why things might go wrong. So on the picture on the left, we have a kidney that is recovering from acute kidney injury. And we see that though its architecture isn't normal, it's regained, the tubule has regained the brush border. Most of the cells are nucleated again um, after they have differentiated. And here we see a few inflammatory cells, but we see large capillaries close to the tubule. And on the right-hand side of this picture, we see a kidney which has gone into what we call a maladaptive repair process, a process of cro chronic inflammation. So we see there's a lot of inflammatory cells surrounding the tubule. We see a lot of fibroblasts and myofibroblasts producing uh, connective tissue, which are pushing these smaller capillaries further away. We, so we see capillary rarefication. And this is what the process that probably happens when the kidney goes over to a chronic state of deficiency. And there are a number of factors which increase the risk of developing chronic kidney disease after AKI. And these include hypoxia, and that's obviously a vicious circle with these uh, capillaries that are moving further away and producing uh, further hypoxia and f further inflammation. Patients who are aging and who have chronic kidney disease already have a pro-inflammatory status going on already, and that's just exacerbate, exacerbated by having AKI. And patients who have hypertension and diabetes um, have uh, already endothelial damage, which again exacerbates the hypoxic situation occurring. So the epidemiology of AKI is unknown. Um, we looked back on one of our groups that we followed up um, with creatinine and tried to look quickly at the epidemiology of it in terms of incidence. And we found in a group of our AKI survivors that it was about 18.7%. So this is, this, this is uh, defining by a rising creatinine over 1.5 times um, in the days, 70 to 90 days after AKI. Now, chronic kidney disease is difficult to know the instance of because few people follow up the patients, um, and uh, so register studies underestimate the incidence. But a few uh, good studies have been done, um, and they seem to have found that it, there's an instance of chronic kidney disease of between 20 and 45% after AKI. So it's a significant problem, and this was backed up by a meta-analysis performed in 2011 by Coco and colleagues, and they found a hazard ratio of 8.8 for patients with and without AKI for developing chronic kidney disease. And recovery ought to be the inverse of chronic kidney disease, but definitions vary somewhat. But here again, if we look at the, the last column on the right, we see that recovery is somewhere between 60 to 80% in most populations. The last population had a very high mortality in the Schiffel study. Um, so we see chronic kidney disease occurring in 20 to 40, 45% of patients, and some of those go on to develop end-stage renal disease. So here we see that if you simply present with acute kidney injury, in the last column here, at five years, you have an almost 4% chance of developing end-stage renal disease. 
And if you present a little bit like our lady has in this case with uh, acute on chronic disease, your risk may be up to 25%. This, this is data from our long-term follow-up study from the um, Swedish Intensive Care Register. So it's a huge risk for patients with pre-existing chronic, re chronic renal disease. And again, uh, our data was backed up by the meta-analysis by COCA, which found a four to five-fold increase in end-stage renal disease among patients with pre-existing chronic kidney disease. So what about uh, morbidity uh, and other organs? Well, AKI is actually uh, independently associated with other organ failures in the long term. And these include cardiac and cardiorenal syndromes, so patients have an increased risk of hypertension, ischemic heart disease, heart failure, and early cardiac deaths. There is a bilateral association with COPD and AKI. These patients have an elevated risk of having stroke, both ischemic and embolic, and an elevated risk of suffering from dementia. And the immune system is also affected. So we see patients with an increased risk of suffering from sepsis and other infections, and in particularly from reactivation or new infection from tuberculosis. And there's an association with neoplasms. These patients uh, suffer also from GI bleeds to a greater extent than non-AKI ICU patients in the long term and we see an increased number of bone fractures amongst them. So there really are a lot of organs that are affected. And the reasons for this are many and complex, but just to name some of the things that um, post-AKI patients suffer from, this includes uh, disturbance of electrolytes and volume hemostasis and endothelial dysfunction, which may, be res may result in these cardiovascular problems that we see. There's also a disturbance of metabolism and endocrine function, and patients um, have a disturbance of their bone mineralization, which may result in fractures. Iron hemostasis is disturbed, and this may result in oxidative stress, causing end organ dysfunction, and also may be responsible for the dementia that we see. And then the most profound effect is probably on immunity, where we have a pro-inflammatory response, which is systemic. We see disturbance of cytokine function. We see uh, ne uh, neutrophil trafficking and alterations in T cell populations, which over time cause epigenetic changes, which may explain the increased risk of neoplasm among these patients. So what might we be able to do to improve the situation? Well, we might be able to prevent AKI, and that's another discussion. Treatment may be optimized on ICU, fluid optimization, perhaps looking at uh, uh, renal replacement therapy treatment timing, dose, modality. But I'd like to discuss intervention after ICU. So, we at our hospital don't have a structured follow-up program for AKI patients' renal function. I don't know if any of you have in your hospitals. Uh, very few people worldwide do anyway. It's somewhere below 15% worldwide. And this is a rather interesting study from the renal data system who released this data. They looked at patients who'd suffered from acute kidney injury and they noted who they'd been referred to. And within a year, most have seen a general practitioner over 55% have seen a cardiologist, but having suffered from AKI, only 18% are referred to a nephrologist. And if it was the inverse, and it was a patient who had had a myocardial infarction, I wonder if this would be the same. Well, you might ask, what could a nephrologist actually do? Um, could there be any intervention that would help? Well, there's tentative evidence that they may be able to help, and we may be able to improve mortality and perhaps outcome in terms of development of end-stage renal disease. Harrell and colleagues conducted a randomized control trial where they um, sent half of the AKI patients uh, post-ICU for early nephrological follow-up, and they saw a small but significant reduction in mortality for these patients. And in Silver's study, they saw that when patients were sent for nephrological follow-up, intervention followed in 70% of patients. 
So you might ask, what might a nephrologist do that would magically change anything? Well, I think it's probably a combination of things, uh, interventions and optimization of patients. And to start with, it's probably simply removing nephrologists uh, nephrotoxins from the medications and improving things like blood pressure and glucose control, treatment of anemia and electrolyte imbalance and also life and lifestyle and dietary advice. So if we come back to our lady on ICU with her sepsis and her AKI and we return to the questions that I posed at the beginning of the session, uh, what are this lady's chances of being alive at one and five years? Well, probably about 50% have been alive at one year and maybe 30% uh, risk of, um, uh, or chance of being alive at uh, five years, I should say. Will we know what her renal function is? I would suggest that most of us here don't or won't know what our patient's renal function is after ICU. And her chances of suffering from chronic kidney disease or end-stage renal disease? Well, I'm an optimist, and I'm going to try and uh, ignore the fact that she had a slightly reduced GFR to start with. Uh, but I would say that her chances of CKD are around 30%, and her chances of end-stage renal disease are at least 4%, and possibly much higher. And will she suffer from other organ dysfunctions? Yes, she probably will, or she may do. She's at increased risk anyway of suffering from a diverse number of end organ dysfunctions. So I would like to conclude by asking you to please ensure that your AKI patients who actually survive ICU when you've done a fantastic job to save their lives are actually followed up so we can reduce morbidity and mortality. Thank you. Thank you, Claire, for sharing your insights. Um, I have a question. Um, at our department, we uh, routinely check uh, cystatin C and creatinine-based uh, mean GFR uh, as soon as uh, the creatinine levels have stabilized. And if the patient is, has a GFR under 30, uh, they're referred for follow-up the, before discharge from the hospital. If it's still under 30, we give a referral to the nephrologists. So my question is, how do you think we should design follow-up to optimize nephrology resources? Well, first of, all, first of all, I'd like to give you a gold star because someone's following them up, and I'm very pleased to hear this. Um, we're in the process of performing a number of studies to look at follow-up and looking at which markers we should check as well. I think certainly the patients that we see that are at increased risk, those that have had... We, need, we, need, we can't follow everybody up, so we need to be t doing targeted follow-up. And you've highlighted a GFR under 30, and certainly those patients are at great increased risk, but probably patients with a GFR under 60, uh, all of them would ideally be followed up. But I would try and design a follow-up where we look at patients at three months, uh, it seems to be a time where we see some kind of stabilisation in the renal function. And I would look at patients that are ageing, patients with pre-existing renal dysfunction, and those with severe GFR um, decreasement, I would say. Thank you.